In November 1941, a new stage began for me. I returned to my old unit, the 5th Company. While I was assigned to the repair shop, the company relocated from Fyodina on the Dnieper to Gyatsk, where it's currently resting as part of the unit commanded by Hauptmann Stern. We're awaiting our transfer to Germany here. It seems unlikely that we'll be deployed again soon, as our last attack from Kalinin on the Volga Reservoir was executed with only 36 Skodas, 10 Panzer IV, and 12 Panzer II. Several of these broke down, leaving the regiment without sufficient numerical strength. In Jatsk, I've reunited with my old gunner, Vitkota and Kapruch, a newcomer assigned to me by Hiller. We're staying in a relatively clean Russian house, free of bugs, fleas, and lice. There's little to do. The company sleeps until 8 a.m., and there's no point in conducting training for so few men. I led a column of repaired vehicles from the workshop to Prietschis lawyer. My team covered the route through the swamps from Koln to Katelki, or more precisely, Kasulina, in two days. We had to stay in that village for two days due to repairs needed on the man diesel, low fuel and supplies, and a shortage of ether for the diesels. In Petronina, I found a bakery column that provided us with 120 loaves of bread, and in Yasma, we organised additional supplies, including tobacco. The roads leading to the roll barn were indescribably bad, undoubtedly the worst I've encountered in Russia so far. Along many segments of the route from Cholm to Katelki and beyond, the vehicles had to be pulled through the bottomless mud by a half-tracked pioneer prime mover. Anything not worth this effort was simply abandoned on the open road, left to potentially hibernate there over the winter. In the villages along the roads, we couldn't find any accommodation. Every place was filled with troops who had previously been stuck at Kolm and were now using the favourable weather to reach the roll barn. Between Kasulina and Fyodina, I encountered Hauptmann Novag and his unit. One of his Russian soldiers, who was born in Hamburg and a cabaret tap dancer, ran up to me and shook my hands for a final farewell. News had spread among the Russian prisoners that I was leaving the workshop, and they shouted farewell wishes and well-being in both German and Russian. This surprising gesture left me in awe. I have restored a semi-automatic rifle to working condition. I took this dirty and completely rusted rifle from a pile at the captured goods collection point in Cholm. I also found a matching scope and have just mounted it. Now I just need to sight it in. This is the second semi-automatic rifle I've restored in this manner. The effort is worthwhile, giving a sense of achievement. The woman of the house where I am staying is quite clean and knows how to be useful. However, today and yesterday, she didn't make the beds. I wondered where she had disappeared to. When I visited Hiller and the company today, I discovered why she seldom returns to the house. Nearby at the station, some infantrymen had dismantled a shed for firewood. That's where I found Natasha, assisting them. All the quality wood ended up in her house. For two full days, this industrious woman had been gathering firewood, so much so that she left her two small children to fend for themselves most of the day. Now she stood before me laughing, proudly showing off the enormous pile of firewood she had acquired. I didn't mind, at least it will be warm if my stay here extends. In other news, our division has captured the dam of the Volga and the canal, all without our involvement. The Russians are now launching heavy counterattacks there, similar to what happened on the Luga. Today, four tanks from the 7th Company headed towards the front, the only four operational tanks in the Zhatsk area. Another company led by Hofmeyer is also at the front. Everyone else, including the Oberst, who recently served as the town commander of Kalinin, and Lova, the former commander of 1st Abteilung, remains here. It seems our once mighty regiment of three Abteilungen has dwindled to the size of a single full company, mainly due to technical breakdowns. The old vehicles just can't endure any more. On the 21st, a practice alarm caused utter chaos. Yesterday, while I was teaching Willem some Russian, a fire alarm sounded. The house Willem had recently stayed in caught fire due to a chimney issue. A Panzer IV AUSF. E was parked nearby. A bucket of fuel, used by the men to delouse their uniforms, was right next to the house's wall. The chimney fire's heat caused the wall's wood to glow red hot, eventually igniting the fuel in the bucket outside.
A Russian hastily arrived with a bucket of water, which he threw onto the burning fuel, inadvertently causing the fire to spread more rapidly. The thirty men of the sixth company staying inside the house realized the severity of the situation too late. The flames rapidly engulfed the entire wooden building, leaving the soldiers no time to salvage their belongings. Lieutenant Dirks lost all his clothing, equipment and a film camera. He was left with only the clothes he was wearing. We attempted to tow the Panzer IV away from the blaze using two lorries. However, the tank, damaged by an anti-tank gun hit, had its gearbox damaged and its tracks deeply embedded in the soft ground, making it immovable. The tank was full of fuel and ammunition, posing a significant explosion risk. As the fire intensified, the inevitable happened. First, the rubber of the Panzer IV wheels caught fire. Then, in quick succession, Fuel tank first, fuel tank two, fuel tank three, the machine gun ammunition, and finally the cannon shells ignited. The tank exploded violently, its turret was hurled away, and the frontal armour plate flew 200 metres, narrowly avoiding causing any casualties. The sound of the heavy metal plate whistling through the air was distinctly audible. Meanwhile, all neighbouring houses were drenched in water to prevent the fire from spreading. The Panzer IV was completely destroyed. When Hauptmann Stern later arrived in his command tank, he forbade us from moving the still glowing and smouldering wreckage. There was a genuine risk of more houses catching fire if we dragged the tank, which still contained unexploded ammunition, along the road. I've only now realised the purpose behind the large spaces between Russian houses and the numerous firefighting ponds along the roads. Previously, these features had seemed insignificant to us. In the early days, a burning house was preferable to one that wasn't aflame. No Russians would shoot at us from a house that was on fire. Now, however, there are strict orders that every building is valuable as winter quarters. I returned to the collection point and picked up two more semi-automatic rifles, one for Oberleutnant Bethke and another for myself. These will serve as gifts if we manage to leave this place. According to the latest gossip, the Oberst is flying to Berlin to request that our regiment be withdrawn for re-equipping with new tanks. The division has approved this request and forwarded it to the Gruppe. The request also includes a suggestion that the regiment, once reorganised, should be reassigned to the 6th Panzer Division. We're clinging to the hope of departing before Christmas. We had all anticipated a grand parade following a campaign like this, but the reality is starkly different. Our company doesn't have a single operational tank left. They've either hit mines, burned out, or been repeatedly repaired, and now lie broken down on roads and fields north of Moscow, stripped for parts. Rumours are circulating that we might be equipped with captured Russian tanks. Ideally, the heavy 52-ton ones, which we could potentially take into the Urals. In December 1941, we found ourselves in Klin. The temperatures have plummeted to below minus 20 degrees Celsius, and it's surprising that no one has suffered from frostbite yet. My platoon has taken shelter in a settlement that once had electric lighting, indicating a once higher standard of living. I have settled into a quite nice house. We are the first soldiers to occupy it, and the locals are going out of their way to accommodate us. They have provided us with mattresses, so we don't have to sleep on straw. We'll use them if they're free of bugs. Two women in the house speak some German. One of them appears to be German or Finnish, with beautiful blonde hair unlike any I have seen on a Russian. I must remind myself not to romanticise. I don't want to fall for a Russian woman. This reminds me of a boy I met in Molashno Gigant, who offered me his family's bed. When I refused to sleep in the bug-infested bed, he commented, Germansky nix kultura, and then blew his nose in his hand through his thumb and index finger. The situation here is stable. We remain in clean to resupply with ammunition and wait for the other companies. Wilhelm Lope has also arrived with his large lorry full of men after a lengthy journey. I plan to visit him later to check on his well-being. From Klin, we will march on foot to the positions we are supposed to take over from the 14th Infantry Division, M.O. Tar. Our companies are now under the command of this division and are set to relieve one of its battalions in the area. The destination is 25 kilometres away. We are planning to load our weapons and equipment onto a hand-drawn sledge. 
Secretly, I'm still hoping that we'll be back on the road before Christmas. Last Friday at 8.45am, our last tank failed us, a panzer regiment without panzers. Currently, seven of us are sitting around a table in the house, writing. Koprush and another young soldier from the third company are trying to draw Christmas cards. At 11am, an aircraft is scheduled to take the mail to Germany. I'm at a loss for what to write home. My apathy is so profound that I care about nothing anymore. This sentiment led me to sleep as early as 4pm yesterday. This morning, Witkotter discovered four lice and a flea in his underwear, which had tormented him all night. This prompted a general bug hunt, and after a thorough wash, I also put on fresh undergarments. Fortunately, I didn't find any bugs. Here in Klin, there used to be a large gunpowder factory, and on our side of the river, two glass factories. Obergefreiter Konkol has managed to obtain some baubles from one of these factories. I'm curious if we'll have the opportunity to use them. It baffles me why Infantry Bataillon Stern is still operationally deployed, even though Kohl received confirmation from the OKH that the regiment would be withdrawn for reformation in the Heimat. Rumours suggested this could happen between December 1st and 8th, but rumours are just that. Orders must be executed. In this house there is a Russian family with a man who once worked at one of the glass factories. During the revolution he fought against Wrangel and Pilsudski. This reminds me of Kozlowski, my tailor back in Thorn, who fought with Pilsudski against the Russians. Let's hope this current armed conflict will be the last for a long time. The first half of this century has already seen too much bloodshed. One of the women in this house is a doctor who used to earn 300 rubles per month. Her mother, aged 50 and belonging to the old intelligentsia class, speaks German, a language once taught in schools here. The doctor has two handsome, bright and impeccably clean boys. Then there's the young blonde woman and her daughter. She's the first woman I've encountered in Russia with manicured hands. Dressed in her black fur coat and cap, highlighting her shining hair, she looks enchanting. It's high time we returned to the Reich, especially for me. I need to get back to my bachelor life, away from these dull Russian faces. I yearn to listen to proper music at the Ulster Pavilion, attend concerts at the theatre, and not just through the radio of the Feldwebel. Lately I've been yearning for civilian life and reflecting on my achievements, which up to this point seem very, very little. My time in the army has been a period of decline. There's no gratitude here, and recognition is reserved only for the sycophants. This was evident when Oswald was nominated for the German Cross. If I have children in the future, my son will not join the army, and my daughter will not be part of the female labour service. Our generation has seen enough of these organisations. All of my comrades are against joining any military organisation created by the SA post-war. However, I would still consider rejoining the SAS. But then, when I am back home, I will need time to study and will probably think differently. We trekked a distance of 25 kilometres, in temperatures below minus 25 degrees Celsius, over roads as smooth and frozen as glass. The result? 50% of the men sustained some kind of injury. We're dealing with frozen feet, toes, heels, noses, cheeks and ears. Several have severely swollen lymph nodes in the groin and blisters on their feet. Many are now feeling the effects of old wounds, which limit their movement. Yesterday evening we learned that we would go on a march today, yet we still haven't received any ammunition, and the artilleryman's company lacks warm clothing. This march was akin to a walk through hell, possibly no less dreadful than that experienced by the remnants of Napoleon's defeated army. Enough for today, we need to switch off the lamps. Fourteen of us are crammed into a small farmer's hovel, uncertain of what the future holds. We're waiting again, sitting in a farmer's cottage in Dortchevo. We were supposed to continue at 9.30am after the exhausting march, everyone slept well, and it was relatively warm. In one corner, a young woman is breastfeeding her baby, performing this deeply human task without any sense of shame. This Russian culture seems to lack the stimulation of senses through pictures of more or less clothed women, as seen in certain magazines. I've also never heard any lewd jokes here. Yesterday, Hofmeyer's company arrived. They had been relieved after losing their last tank. Poor devils, they called us when they learned we had been reduced to infantry. 
I don't want to complain, but this situation is infernally challenging. I've recuperated a bit, but my legs, overstrained from walking on the icy roads, are still in considerable pain. Currently, Enns and another man are distributing the completely frozen rations. The loaves of bread have turned into ice blocks, which is nauseating. It was an excruciatingly cold night. We were alarmed because the Russians had attacked on the right and had breached the line across the road to Dmitrov. We anticipated an attack in our sector as well. The entire night was spent waiting in our reinforced machine gun positions. Then, in the morning, we were deployed about a kilometre further west into the village. Our company, along with an anti-tank section, is tasked with defending it. The tank hunters have informed us that the entire front line from Dimitrov to Kalinin Klin is being pulled back. In the front, they are destroying all the vehicles we can't take with us. It feels like all our sacrifices have been for nothing. On the march from Dorchevo to Rogachevo, we passed the graves of Unterofizier Specorius and Gefreiter Preus from the 6th Company. If I didn't know that wars and armed conflicts will always exist among people, I might find myself marching under the pacifist banner, akin to the reconciliation prophets who proliferated after the World War. However, I don't hold much hope for the success of such endeavours. The suffering and inhumanity I've witnessed in recent days alone are enough to convince me of the futility of these efforts. Last night, Siberian riflemen, the formations we are facing here, broke into Rogachevo from the east and set several houses ablaze. They haven't attacked from the north, where we are holding the line, but that could still happen. Yesterday, Stuka bombers flew overhead, targeting something invisible ahead of us. We're fortunate that the wind has died down, as we already have more than enough cases of frostbite in my platoon. The fact that our sentry posts didn't suffer frozen feet last night is solely because we found enough hay to stand on. The sight of Rogachevo in flames last night was both infernal and glorious. The church appeared like a fairy tale castle from the Arabian Nights, with its white spires adorned with oriental decoration and the blood red, golden, onion shaped domes hauntingly illuminated against the dark night sky. Amid this infernal concert, Russian guitara fired incendiary oil shells at us, while Russian pilots dropped magnesium bombs and various other ordnances on us. The Russians clearly possess aerial superiority in this area. Over our sector, we have Spanish fighter pilots, while the Russians boast cheeky English pilots in bomber aircraft. Currently, the infantry's baggage trains are moving past, retreating towards Klin. It's now 1 p.m., and I am deployed as a reserve platoon until 6 p.m. I'm hoping we'll also be on the move by then. Our artillery has already repositioned to the rear. It's uncertain what challenges await us poor infantrymen in the coming night. Today, our rations included a whole bar of chocolate, reminding us that it's the second Sunday of Advent. Right now, Russian bombers are heavily targeting our withdrawal routes. A Russian tank attack is also underway, and our anti-tank guns have been repositioned. Captured Russians have reported that six Russian divisions are attacking our position. Dinner today wasn't particularly enjoyable. Pearl barley again? The local Russian inhabitants are fleeing too, a sure sign that things will become more challenging here shortly. My concern grows for our wounded and sick who are unable to walk. Since yesterday, I felt a deep sense of empathy for Napoleon, who, despite being undefeated, was compelled to retreat from Russia. Now I am witnessing a similar retreat. Although on a smaller scale, it's no less harrowing than what he experienced. My mother used to tell me stories about the French and their allies wrapping rags around their feet and wearing women's skirts for warmth. Now I have experienced that myself. Yesterday we faced a moral defeat, much like Napoleon's victorious troops. Forced to retreat, we, the former Panzer men, were sent from Jatsk to this location to cover our retreat and torch villages. We've become nothing less than murderous arsonists. Honestly, I've had enough of this. But one thing at a time, as this time, writing isn't even calming my anger. The divisions operating on our left flank, which were still motorised before the onset of the muddy conditions, had managed to reach and cross the Dimitrov Canal along with our 6th Panzer Division. However, they were forced to fall back to a defensive line in front of Klin. Six fresh, excellently equipped Siberian formations, part of the Russian divisions, 
then pressed towards our bridgehead at Klin and south of it. The 30th Russian Army is advancing towards Spaskoya along the Rolban, encompassing Klin, Rogachevo, where we were stationed the previous nights, and the river crossing at Woronina. That's the extent of my knowledge of the general situation here, north of Moscow. We were relieved during a fierce snowstorm on Sunday. Around midday, we were ordered to prepare the village for burning and ready ourselves for withdrawal to Woronina, a journey of over 20 kilometres. I only realised it was Sunday in the afternoon, and it felt like mockery when I informed the men. Rogachevo and the villages in front had changed hands several times the previous night. They were still being defended by our rear guard. Any vehicles we couldn't take with us were destroyed, and all houses were set ablaze. We received the same order for our village. By 3.30pm, it was getting dark, and we began loading our baggage onto the company's lorries. At 4pm, the first vehicles departed from Bogdanabo towards the rear. Stern stayed in the village for a while, and during the night requested support from one of our platoons because the 6th Company had reported Russian advances from the north. As a result, only two of our platoons remained in the small village, while Matusik and his men were sent to Bogdanabo. Vuncha, I and our platoons stayed in our small village. We were scheduled to withdraw during the night, or at the latest by early morning at 6am, after the infantry companies with their baggage had passed through. The plan was to torch the houses then. I, with my platoon, was to act as the rear guard until we reached Safregano, where the 6th Company would withdraw after we passed. Everything proceeded as planned, until Hiller, in a panic, prematurely torched his allocated house just as the first self-propelled anti-tank gun rolled into the village. That was a foolish move. Hiller, desperate not to lose connection with the infantry at any cost, quickly drove away in his kubel. The house burned so intensely that the horses of the columns entering the village refused to pass by and had to wait until the fire subsided. However, that didn't happen. The strong wind only intensified the flames, and soon all the other houses, prepped with hay and doused in petrol by our platoon, were also ablaze. We walked among the burning houses, past lines of wailing women and children, towards the village's end, where Hiller waited, eager to reach Safragino as soon as possible. In Safragino, it was Eggers who panicked and set fire to the houses too early, long before we had even marched through. In school, we learned about the Vikings, who torched entire fishing villages and the Thirty Years' War, with its suffering populations whose cities, towns and villages were burned by inhuman marauding soldiers. So many fires that the entire night sky was illuminated by their blood-red glow. In East Prussia, people still remember how the Russians burned down villages during World War II. We have now experienced it ourselves. We have witnessed the horrified faces of wailing women and heard the miserable cries for help from the elderly. We have seen livestock running in fear and heard cattle and horses screaming in terror. We have seen mothers with their children too terrified to even speak. Now we know how a German soldier feels when, according to the harsh laws of war, they are forced to commit such brutalities themselves. Just now, Russian artillery has placed a few large shells right in front of us, so close that we can hear the splinters whistling. Then we all had some aquavit, the finest vodka. Matchmam, or matka, as she is called here, lit a fire that emits volcanic heat. And now I sit at the table with the card players near the petroleum lamp. What should I write about? Oh yes, I almost forgot to write about the march to Woronina. The wind blew snow into our eyes. Alarm! What is actually happening here? That is the question we all ask ourselves here in Sikurung's Bataillon Stern. The watchword? Total solidarity. If one doesn't want to use the other, more familiar quotation. Morale? just like the temperature, always more or less below zero. Outside on the street, infantry marches past. They are just as exhausted as we were. The tension was slightly relieved when a message came from Klin, informing us that we were no longer surrounded, and the danger of the Siberians closing the pocket by moving south behind Klin had passed for the time being. During the briefing, Wunscher clearly stated that there might be a chance for us to escape to the south of Klin. In doing so, he openly voiced the idea of fleeing. 
This is what we had come to. Last night, the IB of the division reported via radio that our baggage vehicles had managed to get past Klin and across the road threatened by the Russians. A great relief for us was that our meagre belongings, including the few blankets and tent squares, as well as our wounded comrades, were safe. Stubborn and numb, with tired faces and exhausted limbs, the men outside slogged through the snow to man the machine guns at the barns in the field. It was snowing heavily and freezing cold, and every single man was happy when his hour outside was over and he could come in again. Graw has just told me that he saw a construction battalion moving through outside. An Oberfeldwebel of that unit had informed him that with their 45-year-old men, they had defended their positions against Russian attacks in the north of Woronina. Thirty of their men and an old Oberleutnant had been taken prisoner. They had then been replaced by Kradschutzen of the 36th or 14th Infantry Division, Motiti, who had managed to rescue the prisoners by force. All of them, except the old Oberleutnant, had been shot by the Russians. This again confirms what has always been happening. In a situation like the one we find ourselves in here, during the withdrawal to Klin, all old platitudes crumble and all masks come off. Out here there is only one thing that can help the Lancer, soldier, to survive. He has to adopt the stance of, may the whole world lick me in the arse. And if he manages to do that, he'll be able to act like the men of IR-53, who, while being flanked and marching through villages already half-occupied by the enemy, responded to calls of rookie Wurch by throwing a bunch of hand grenades in front of the Russians' feet. Now it is 10 a.m. and I am with the boss. He has been called to see Hauptmann Stern and has summoned us before he goes there. Soon he'll return, take off his glasses and announce that we'll have to leave our boiling potatoes and the meat, expertly prepared by Unterofficier Enns, to move into a new position. What are we supposed to eat then? We have become rather modest in our wishes, and we were as happy as children under the Christmas tree when Feldwebel La made an appearance yesterday with a stale old loaf. My old orderly, Erdweg, has taken up a guitar, and even though we are all in a sombre mood, we have raised our voices to sing the Wild Goose Song, a song that our fathers sang out here in the East, and which I have had a soft spot for since my time in the Bundesher Jugend. More fitting for our mood, our longing for home and what we hold dear, are the songs that he is playing now, and to which we are singing as well. In moments like this, it's the eyes of those Lanza, soldiers, who went through the thick of it that are the first to fill up with tears. Outside, our artillery is firing, and we hardly look up anymore when the Russians send some of their shells over to us. They have placed a few layers on our rearguard positions, and up in Klin there has been some shelling as well. Quite substantial shelling, even. We don't care about it. The last two days have been worse than this. High Command is urging us not to give up and to hold out a bit longer, telling us that large reserves are being diverted up here. But what use are reserves that are in the same bad shape as we are? Motorised regiments with five or ten working lorries. The others have been blown up, or where we have failed to do that, have been taken for a ride by the Russians. Now we are singing During a Day in Spring, and when we reach the part where it goes Wo Fortuna Winker Winker Macht, we all think about just how much luck we have had so far and in the previous days. Oberleutnant Hiller has returned with news. The situation is serious, but not hopeless. The second panzer division is coming from the south to clear the Rollbahn again. The positions along the Sestra and at Woronina are supposed to be held by those divisions deployed to secure the withdrawal. These positions will become the main combat line this winter. In the north, it runs behind Spaskoye toward the motorway and the crossing of the storage reservoir. In the south, it runs toward the road systems captured by our Panzer Division, which means that here, north of Moscow, the line runs from south-southeast to north-northwest. With sorrow, we remember those who have fallen in combat for the canal bridgeheads. In the summer, as our motorised vehicles ended up on the vehicle graveyards one by one, the Lanza, soldiers, began to organise panzer wagons to transport their belongings. One horse pulled while another followed behind, allowing us to continue our advance. Hay could be found everywhere, and if not, there was usually oat straw or something similar. Now we have all switched over to sledges. 
My platoon has two horse and sledge teams supplied by Brune, the great organiser. We use them to transport our machine gun boxes and the soldiers with bad feet. These sledges are simple, taken from some kolkhoz or farmer's barn. They lack iron runners, so they don't run as smoothly as the ones we are accustomed to in Germany. Nevertheless, we can make some headway with them. It is now 2 p.m., and it will soon get dark again. A battery of heavy mortars, 21 centimetres calibre, is rolling past. I wonder where they are going, asks a man who is also looking out of the window. In the corner to my right, three men are humming old Schläger melodies, Ola Meyer, Königshofen and Schaefer. Schaefer is a passionate tango enthusiast from Krefeld and a technical draftsman. Ola Meyer is also a very young soldier. The group is not complete at the moment, as Kopunik is absent. He is also a guy who still displays certain childish mannerisms. All of them have only recently been sent from the replacement battalion and joined us shortly before we were reformed to become the Stern Battalion. But what else can these young lads talk about? They haven't seen anything else yet. Bruna claimed to have found a few ropes and a quilted blanket in a Russian bunker. But then the woman of the house started screaming blue murder. I have instructed Brune to return her blanket to her. In the upcoming night, the defensive line will be pulled back to Klin. Even further back. More men will fall into Russian hands, vehicles, cannons and tanks that will have to be blown up, and more villages will go up in flames. To cover the retreat, they have now at least sent the last working tanks down here, all of which were still operational in the 1st, 2nd and 7th Panzer Divisions. From those three divisions, we now have about 45 to 50 tanks of all types, from Skoda 38 to the German Panzer 3B. It is a comforting feeling to know that these weapon systems, to which one feels such a close bond, are in close proximity. In the last few days, these tanks have destroyed quite a lot of Russian ordnance in counter-thrusts, which has given us a bit of respite. The Russians are still shelling us quite heavily here, but they are not as dangerous anymore. They are now unable to put coordinated fire on all the villages along the withdrawal route, of which they have excellent flanking views. Currently there is lively aerial activity. The Russians are operating some new types here, Curtis and Spitfire fighters. The Rata bumblebees are still around too. On the airfield at Klin, tanks of the 1st Panzer Division have recaptured over 30 Messerschmitt machines. In four days it will be Christmas. Our withdrawal of those divisions that had advanced too far to the east has ended according to the plan. The 6th Panzer Division has covered the withdrawal of LVI, Army Corps towards the Lama position and has now become the Corps Reserve in the area of Shachovskaya. With Sikarung's Bataillon Stern, we are now based close to the Ib of the division. I don't know how long we are going to be in reserve. That can change quickly before Christmas. We have survived the withdrawal. I am unable to describe all the cruel days, the hardships and the drudgery. I can summarise it thus. It was the worst thing we soldiers experienced in the whole campaign. Now that I sit here at the table with the scat players again, I can't help but think that Christmas is approaching, and we are still here in this paradise. Four military policemen had stayed here before us and left a dried-out advent wreath. Yes, those brothers had the time to think about things like this. On today's march, I walked at the head of the company on the right side of the road when a large car pulled up next to me and a monocled general looked out of the rear window. I turned around and made my report. Upon seeing the clean-shaven face with the monocle and the two stars on the braided shoulder boards, I immediately realised that this was none other than General Reinhardt, the commander of the Panzer Gruppe. Fifth Company, Panzer Regiment 11, currently on foot, on the march to the assembly area of the 6th Panzer Division at Shachoskaya. He asked me a few questions related to our deployment and then sped on. This afternoon, Tutars and Muller, my old comrades in arms, came by. Soon our whole old 5th Company gathered in the room together. With a bottle of schnapps and a few bottles of champagne, we toasted the successful withdrawal. We sat there for a long time, chatting away. I can't keep my eyes open anymore. I am too tired. Last night's march is taking its toll. I wish I could switch positions with Unteroffizier Gaia, who is once again unable to sleep today. This morning I first enjoyed a nice cup of coffee, 
I received a few parcels in the mail two days ago, and the contents reminded me and my comrades in the old manner that yet another week had passed. It is also the fourth Sunday of Advent, the last one before Christmas. Vit Cotter, my old loader, had received a few pieces of ham from home, and used some of it to make a sandwich for me. It tasted wonderful. Then I was called to Hiller. It's always the same old story. Farewells always come when it's most comfortable. An advance party has just set out to secure new quarters for us in a different village, and I had just given my laundry to the woman here in the house. Damn! My laundry is in dire need of a wash. The morning's control sweep had located a range of lice and nits. It makes me want to cry. I have done my utmost to keep as clean as possible. Every morning, with my bear behind, I have stood outside, brushing out the impractical black trousers. I have washed and groomed myself. And now, during this lousy withdrawal, where there was no time to wash, the beasts immediately move into one's pants. It helps to know that I am not alone. All landers search their clothing in the mornings, and most of them find similar results. It will get better one day. Yesterday, Tutas and Muller were here with a bottle of schnapps. We had invited them to come over again and spend Christmas with us. Now that has fallen through completely, as it looks like we'll be back in action over Christmas. There are rumours making the rounds that Brauchic has resigned. I don't know if that is true. In the last few days there have been plenty of rumours. Tobruk hasn't been lost after all, and neither has Singapore. I am wondering what will become of us. During the withdrawal, we were forced to burn the mail of other divisions, as there was no way we could have taken it with us. In other cases, starving landers have torn open the parcels on abandoned mail transports, in the hope of finding something edible in the contents. The letters were just stomped into the snow. Disgusting. Just as disgusting is that they abandoned a baggage lorry. I saw how the landers ripped open the officers' chests, surgical and medicine boxes in the search for food. Many just took things that might have appeared valuable to them in that moment, and only a few days later, when the things had proven to be useless, they too were trampled into the dirt. I will not talk about this withdrawal. I am not diplomatic enough to smooth over these events, which are the greatest mess I have ever experienced, with words, and I want to avoid being court-martialed as a mutineer. On Monday morning in Tarachoa, I was so mentally and physically broken that I collapsed. After that night's march, I couldn't go on any more, and after I had reached the house of the Ib, I just fell over. Even with lots of bean coffee and Rockter's 97% volume schnapps, I only regained my feet after two days. The field gendarmes also failed miserably during the withdrawal. They should focus on regulating sexual intercourse instead of the vehicle traffic of an entire corps. Without the help of officers and old purses of combat units, they would have failed miserably to organise and guide the wild columns. In many cases, the gendarmes just ran away when they feared they would be cut off. The worst swinishness, however, was that the 23rd Infantry Division never held its rearguard positions and always withdrew prematurely. This allowed the Russians to encircle us afresh every day, while the horse-drawn vehicles of this sprinter's guard then fell back on the same road which our corps was withdrawing on thus greatly adding to the traffic chaos. And when the sledges and carts attempted to cut past the traffic across the fields, they very often ran into mines. While I was lying flat in Takaroa, at least ten mines exploded. The withdrawal was conducted with such speed and haste that the dead remained mostly unburied. We had all become so apathetic. Often I had come past the corpses of fallen comrades who had been killed by bomb splinters and strafing. When the Ratas and Curtis came, the soldiers didn't even bother to return fire anymore. That is hardly surprising when one has an empty stomach in this kind of freezing cold. All the more astonishing and laudable is the conduct of our riflemen who covered the withdrawal as a last-ditch rearguard, always surrounded with frozen limbs, nothing to eat, and little ammunition. They halted the exploiting Russian forces and inflicted severe casualties on them in counter-thrusts. Schutzen Regiment 2 is said to have suffered great casualties at Teterino, and the two commanders and the adjutant who relieved us at 12 a.m. were killed at 6 a.m. in the morning when the Russians attacked the village with a whole regiment and 17 tanks. There we can see how much luck we have had. 
Hiller says it's only due to Hauptmann Stern that we didn't have casualties like Hans Koch during attacks and counterattacks. It was just typical that we were forced to leave our quarters in Shachovskaya in the dead of night to make room for some staff formation of the Gruppe. Rarely have I cursed so much as I did this night when we set out in the darkness and a snowstorm. We were hardly able to find our route, and I, as the translator, had to go and ask some Russians for directions. We all felt like we had been banished to Siberia and shared a hatred for all those above the company command level who sat with their fat bellies by a warm stove. As we stomped through the snow, which was already knee-high, we came across another group of men, wrapped up in their coats, bracing against the freezing snow with gritted teeth, just like we were. We shouted over to them, loudly cursing the snow, the roads, and the entire war in general. At first they didn't reply, but then one man among the group shouted back, Weiner Nick's gut. Now we realised that these comrades in suffering, deep in the snow on the other side, were Russian prisoners. This march gave me ample time to think again about the reason why there are always, always two groups of men, cursing and execrating the war as they move through the world. On one side we have Kolkhoz farmers, metal workers and butchers, and on the other fitters, farmers' sons, merchants and craftsmen. Both sides share the same amount of suffering and grief, and every day it is this or the other group which has to bleed more. I tell my men that this is about the reshaping of Europe, the creation and protection of German Lebensraum, the absolute defeat of Bolshevism, the enemy of the people. But have I myself really taken these slogans to heart? Am I myself convinced by what I try to explain to my men so convincingly? Again and again it is damn hard to get my own head around the fact that everything we are being ordered to do here is right and for the benefit of not only our people. It is true that such a war is an eye-opener, even more so when one has experienced the bad sides of a campaign and when the war drags on and on. But I can't help saying to myself, in moments when I profoundly fail to make sense of it all, that Hitler, when he let us loose on the Russians, had already been through the same kind of crap himself, which didn't make a lot of sense then. On the face of it, it is all quite obvious, and from the perspective of the beer table strategists, those deferred from military service and Ortsgruppenleiter, all this here makes sense. But ask a serious man who doesn't just repeat the slogans and who has repeatedly put his own neck on the line if he at times didn't have the same thought. As far as I can tell, all of them did so. Now we only have the wish that they will leave us alone at Christmas. Again and again, this is what I hear from the men. Otherwise, we're all only thinking from one day to the other. But in this particular instance, we are all thinking three days ahead. We are now under command of Oberstleutnant Limbrun, who has already given us plenty to be angry about in the summer. It was also due to him that we had to set out into the freezing night, this damned East Front Winger who completely misdeployed us at Leningrad and repeatedly sent us on night attacks. The whole platoon is sitting in a nice clean farm cottage together with the company squad. It has already been announced that this 15-house village will also serve as quarters for the staff company. It seems we'll all have to move closer together. But the most important thing is that on Christmas we'll have a roof over our heads. How frugal we have become. We don't even think about celebrating with our families anymore, and don't waste a thought about going home at the start of the new year. Funny? I am writing here like, I am the little tank gunner Pimpelhofer, and not a Prussian leutnant who can look back on such a great number of soldier ancestors that it puts even antiquity to shame. Am I really such a little Philistine that the experiences here are turning me into a pacifist? And even in the face of all these great role models, the Prussian leutnants and the Frederician Farnricks who all knew how to die so nobly, this isn't my ideal. A hero's death? That is a fraud. A hero's life? That's what it should be. There is nothing heroic in death. Only life, lived until the final beat of the heart, can be heroic. Dying is the easiest of things. I have often secretly wished for such a deliverance when I was morally broken, up to the neck in the dirt, only to abandon the thought again. It's this little spark which reignites me in the last moment reminds me of my duty and obligation, and pushes me back onto the path of true Prussian tradition. It's Christmas. 
I have presented some work to the boss regarding the distribution of iron crosses. We've received eight iron crosses, meant for those who distinguished themselves during the withdrawal. Thanks to Stern's tactics, we avoided enemy contact, unlike the old days. Soon we're supposed to head out to shovel snow, but the coffee isn't ready yet, it's just too cold. Even the field kitchen doesn't heat properly anymore with temperatures below minus 30 degrees, and there's a howling snowstorm. It will surely be fun when our bones start to freeze. But Stern seems eager to keep us busy. After the snow, we'll probably be transferred. Oberst Kohl, with 1,000 men, is en route here to build a supply road for the Corps and establish a second defensive line, akin to building bunkers and positions like the Hindenburg Line during the World War. I wonder how the superiors plan to achieve this in such frost and with the ground as hard as stone. In the front lines, the organisation TOT is working with several battalions. We are now expected to spend the winter here. One must adopt a stubborn mindset for the upcoming period. I remind myself that past generations have endured worse. What they managed, we can too. One day there will be peace again, the kind the angels pray for on holy night. Can one even imagine after two years of war, nights without blackouts, no more war on all fronts? At least we could properly celebrate Christmas. In the morning, we cleared a path through the snow, finishing by 1pm. Then we went home, where Laufenberg and Misha, the house owner, had hewn a Christmas tree from a ten-metre-tall fir tree. It was the most glorious tree any of us had ever seen. A wonderful tree, thickly hung with fir cones, which we began to decorate simply yet tastefully. Our supply officer, Bethke, issued an extra ration, including cognac and liquor. From recently arrived parcels, I had saved some sweets and a package of sugar from home for making a proper grog. These small trifles reminded our entire platoon that the season of affectionate secrecies had begun back home. I had managed to prepare small parcels for Eric Lehman and my old loader and batman, Witkotter. For Witkotter, I included a 20-mark note for his loyal services, which he ogled with great delight after reaching the bottom of the box. Renger, the wireless operator, had saved an accordion during the withdrawal. Lauer, knowing how to play it, and Unteroffizier Gregor's baritone voice greatly added to the evening's festivity. The evening passed quickly. Amid the singing, grog and liquor under the beautiful Christmas tree, time flew by unnoticed. I didn't want to make a long speech, and I had told the men as much, but I still said a few words, especially as we hadn't expected such large quantities of alcohol. My aim was to prevent the men from drowning their sorrows in alcohol and though we couldn't avoid the usual revelry, we managed to cope with the fact that we couldn't be with our families on a day so deeply important to us Germans. The village itself was like something out of a fairy tale, ideally situated for the event, deep in a forest. The small stretch of arable land was surrounded by tall, dark fir trees, while the dozen or so cottages along the road nestled into the shadows of these enormous trees, as if seeking shelter from the howling snowstorm. This Rishishcha is indeed a proper Christmas village, though Father Christmas surely had a tough time navigating the snow-covered roads. To give him at least a fighting chance, we spent Christmas morning outside, shoveling snow. The sky was busy with Russian aircraft, ratas and bombers. It made me question what happened to our aerial superiority. I can't stop thinking about the Spanish pilots who allowed the much-desired expensive Messerschmitts to fall into Russian hands. This withdrawal has been catastrophic in terms of losses. I wonder if the rumours about Braukic are true. Having recently met Reinhardt, the commander of the LVI. Kor, I know he hasn't been relieved of his post. So who is to blame for all this? On December 22nd, General Rouse issued an order hinting at spending the winter here and called for increased readiness. A similar order from the division highlighted the need to build a defensive system and switch to sledge traffic. We've been using sledges for a while, but our two horses apparently froze to death while out collecting petrol. One of our carts, loaded with fuel, got stuck in the snow, prompting all the Abteilung sledges to retrieve the petrol cans. The snowstorm raging today is so severe that even the Panjay horses perished in it. It's simply horrible. Surviving out there is a struggle for us humans, with faces, hands and feet freezing. 
and in these conditions we are expected to work and clear roads that the snow immediately covers again. Several men are always sick, recently mostly with stomach ailments. We are all suffering from the damnable runs, and there's nothing much we can do about it. We have constructed a proper privy here in the barn, but some of the sick men can't even make it that far. Currently, Obergefreiter Kronker is lying next to me in the corner, battling a fever of 40.2 degrees. Roland is on the floor next to the barrack oven, squirming in pain. I'm dreading the day when the lice will bring us typhus. Right now, we are only contending with dysentery and influenza, but if typhus were to be added to that, it would be catastrophic. Stabsarzt Moschler just came by to check on Kronker and the other ailing men. If only we had appropriate clothing. The German Lanzer, in his leather footwear, is literally freezing his feet off. The Russians, on the other hand, are wearing practical felt boots that can be pulled up over their knees, providing protection from the snow that easily penetrates our lace-up shoes and the shafts of our jackboots. The thick headscarves worn by the women and the ear-flap caps of the men are the only effective headwear. We used to be amused by the Russians on the Leningrad front wearing quilted jackets and trousers in summer, but now we would be grateful to have them. None of the Russian clothing items look stylish, but they are all highly practical, and if our transport units replaced their motor vehicles with sledges, we would surely make better progress. As it stands, they are all stuck somewhere in the landscape, forcing us to find alternative means of acquiring ammunition, food and petrol. At the moment, no one knows where our luggage is. It remains a mystery. Misha, the muzhik and master of the house, speaks German. He seems to have picked up a few words from us, and I couldn't help but laugh when he approached me to ask for their meaning. Wasili Wasiljevich, Kakpo Ruski. Verdamte Schlamassel das ist, Gott verdammt. During the night, I pondered the fact that we are supposed to stay here throughout the entire winter. Surely we'll receive replacements and new vehicles. When new operations become feasible again in the coming spring, we'll launch attacks that will destroy the Siberian Army of the East. I will be there until an anti-tank gun, an aerial bomb, a shell or a mine puts an end to my life story. If only I could see into the future. Wilhelm Lope is now gone too, and I am the only friend and officer left who has been with me since the start of the campaign. However, I will continue to do my duty, being as stubborn as a cartridge pouch, right up to the final moment. Then my campaign will be complete, the one I eagerly sought after Poland and France. Gosh, at the moment, I am so utterly fed up again. There's no way our division will be leaving Russia any time soon. Now all we can do is endure. My new motto is, the front clicks and the Heimat is happy. Although here the clicking is done with two thumbnails trapping a tiny animal between them. Our new hit song, I want a photo of yourself, no matter if it's small. Always yours, always yours. It's a wonderfully corny tune. We sing it with fanatical foolishness at every opportunity. Defence in the Kolkhoz barn at Timkowo. More than minus 30 degrees cold. Russian attack with four 52-ton tanks. Position held on the night before New Year's Eve. We have to hold out. 